Welcome to another episode of Beer and Politics. We are your voluptuous hosts, Ryan and Ryan. Today, we're discussing what America is doing wrong in politics today. But of course, before we do, Madam Brewmaster, what do we have on tap? Today, we have Wolf Pup from Golden Road Brewing. Wolf Pup is a session IPA. This is, again, sort of a play on a style. An IPA, as you probably know, is really hoppy. It's going to have a lot of booze with it, too. But the session IPA is something, excuse me, that mm. tastes like an IPA that you can have as a session beer. Because if you session up a regular IPA, you're going to get hammered really quick. Yep. Or quickly. Mm. So, your adverb, your choice. <laughs> so, what do you think? Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, it is crisp, it's clean, it's easy to drink, it's very hoppy. Um, I actually, believe it or not, we haven't talked about it, but I actually think session is overstating it. But... Uh, because it is quite hoppy. Ah, yes. That, that's the thing, right? So when I think session, it's like, how many of these can I drink? Mm -hmm. But it's really nice. I mean, if you like IPAs, this is an IPA for you. Uh, I agree. I actually think this is, I actually think it's a fantastic session beer. Mm -hmm. You need to like IPAs, because yes, this is a hoppier beer, but it's only, uh, what is this? Only four and a half percent alcohol, I think? Which yeah. is great for a session. Yeah, 4.5 percent. So we're in that Bud Light zone yeah. of, of alcohol. So you can, you know, you, you can drink a bunch of these and, you know, be okay. Yeah. Uh, I, it is. It's, it's beautifully hoppy. It's light in color. It's crisp. It's refreshing. I think it's almost a perfect, perfect session Ooh, beer. That's good. Okay. What do you, uh, what do you rate it as? I give this four and a half best friends that anyone could have. Oh my. Four and a half. That's good. Mm. All right. I'm going, because we're talking about what America's doing wrong, mm -hmm. I'm going to give it, uh, four Tommy Larens. <laughs> <laughs> Because basically, uh -huh. just about everything she does, she does wrong. <sighs> yeah. She has a lot of opinion ratio for little insight. <laughs> Touche. All right. So, so what are we doing wrong Well, in first of all, I want to oh. say thanks to Golden Road. Yep. Who doesn't sponsor us, but probably should. They're here, close by in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be here waiting and drinking. <laughs> so we're talking about what we're doing wrong here yep. in the United States. Politically, what we're yep. talking about, because, you know, beer and politics. Yep. Um, and I think what we're doing wrong overall is voting. Ooh, continue. Um, so we, from a couple angles here. Number one, we're doing it wrong how people look at voting. Okay. How you? I don't know about you, but I'm gonna say how you look at voting, how I look at voting, yeah. how Americans look at voting. Royal you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and it's it's this people people look at it as such a huge part of of the political process, and, mm -hmm. you know. And they pour enormous amounts of time and effort into, to, you know, finding the right candidate and scouring over it. When in reality, it's, it's only a very, very small portion of what happens in politics. Mm. It's something that if you're taking, if you take standing in line, if you take all that crap out of it, it's something that takes about five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think we should spend about five minutes on. Not worrying about it. And th think about this. When you, when you spend all that time yeah. and all that effort, Really digging into who the person is and what they, what you know, all the best stuff about him, and and really fighting for him. Yeah, it, it kind of distorts your perspective on him. Okay. I think, and and, it, and um, and what you see is you see this with you see it with you saw it with Obama, you saw it with Bush, you definitely see it with Trump. But it's people who defend things about a person that they would never defend <laughs> otherwise. Uh -huh. And That's you can funny. see it from the from the uh, evangelicals who were like, oh, Trump's the most evangelical president. He's about the least evangelical. <laughs> like, like Muslim Obama was way more evangelical mm. than Trump. Mm -hmm. So so you see you see these people defending actions from someone that they never would because they poured so much. It's like we've got a bunch of little press secretaries running around. That's hysterical. And, and as you know, that is the stupidest position in the world. Yep. And, and so yep. I, think, I think we look at that. I think we look at it entirely wrong. There's so much more than just voting. The yeah. problem is that we as Americans don't do any of that other shit. Okay. We don't. Yes. I mean, you can you can have people over to just discuss politics. Mm -hmm. You could watch a beautifully underfunded but over quality YouTube show. Mm -hmm. You could. I can think of one. <laughs> you can talk about things with your friends. You can join a political group. You can go to political meetings. You could run for political office. What? You could go to town meetings. There are so many things. There are so many parts of the political process that we completely leave off the table because we pour all of our effort and all this money into voting. Yeah. And it's seriously, it's such a small portion of it. Hmm. And it distorts the entire process. It distorts everything about our democracy. And I think also the reason when we spend so much time in this, we, we see... 
actually, this is going to lead me into my next point. Okay. The other thing that we're doing wrong with voting is actually the process that we use to vote. Okay. <clears throat> so we have, I know a lot of people, especially with this last presidential election. Yep. They were like, oh my God, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. For sure. And they didn't want to vote for a third party candidate because maybe they were in a swing state. Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> because we, we really spend too much time thinking about who we're voting for. Yeah. But we're actually doing it wrong because I think our system of voting and, you know, one candidate or another, we've ingrained this two party system. Yeah. And I think the way that we vote actually deep, more deeply ingrains this two party system. Yeah. And the thing that sucks about the two-party system here is that uh, divisiveness mm -hmm. and Ooh. creating the other, pushing other people yeah. away, is actually good for business yeah. when it comes to politics. Sure. Think about think about solidifying your base. All of those people are horrible. We're the good ones. And that works for liberals. It works for conservatives. It works in every spectrum, except for people who are trying to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So it's good for business, uh -huh. and it's bad for America. Mm -hmm. And so what I think Preach we need it. to do yeah. is we need to implement ranked choice voting. <gasps> uh -huh. now, it's also, it can be called preferential voting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also called instant runoff in some yeah. cases. Yeah, and labels is, matter. Right. Yeah. And, and so what this is, is this is actually a system of voting. Um, and this graphic that I'm going to throw up on the screen is courtesy of fairvote.org. Mm. Made up it's a system, fake news. <laughs> it's, a system of, it's a system of voting that allows you to rank uh, nice. your choice of candidates. Yeah. So you've got candidate A, B, C, and you're like, I like B the best, C the second best, yeah. and A is the third. You know, they're my third choice, right? Yeah. And so what that does is it allows, uh, let's say, uh, we'll, we'll get into the specifics of how it works, mm -hmm. but if uh, if you like candidate A the best, you say they're my favorite, second favorite, and third favorite, right? And if you like sports, by the way, we do power rankings, we do all kinds of rankings in sports this way, just FYI. That's great. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and so what that does is it elect, it actually encourages you to vote for the candidate you want. Yep. Because if you like them the best, but you're like, oh, I'm not sure they're going to make it. I'm not sure they're going to win. Well, you've got a second choice. Yep. And so what happens in this instant runoff is if they analyze and whoever has the most votes, you know, they're going to win. But they need 50% plus one. You need more than a majority. Or I'm sorry, you need a majority. Mm -hmm. But if no one makes 50%, they look at the person who has the least first choice ballots. Okay. And wow. all of those uh -huh. ballots, that per candidate's eliminated and we go to the second choice and they retally. Oh, wow. This is why it's called instant runoff because it also eliminates the runoff election. There's no mm -hmm. such thing as a runoff election. I like to think as Trump as runoff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I said it. I'm pretty pleased. <laughs> I'm pretty pleased as well. Awesome. Cheers, <laughs> my friend. All right. So... That, that's great because again, it it, uh, it 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 eliminates a runoff election. Yep. It allows you to vote for the person that you want. Yep. And and it actually make, means that the candidate that people vote for is the most liked candidate overall. Yeah. And it it encourages what? it encourages uh, people to be liked by a majority of people mm. rather than to be divisive mm -hmm. and liked only among their own party. Yeah. And actually, what's interesting? This is the graphic I'm talking about. Mm -hmm is that ranked choice voting in some form, whether it be at the city level or the state level, or even you know a county level, is actually implemented or in the progress of being implemented in more than half of the United States. That's awesome. Among certain Rangers. levels, Oakland, Oakland, California, for instance, mm -hmm. they, uh, they use it. it for their mayor and uh, various city officials. Pretty interesting system. That's awesome. And that's what I think we should do. That's what you're doing wrong, America. Cheers. Cheers. I like that a lot. Thanks. Next right. round? Yeah, I got this. Um, <laughs> so you stole my thunder a bit. You piece of shit. It's um, me. Sorry, I apologize. So, <clears throat> we do three things wrong. The first one is uh, we don't affect change. Mm. Uh, the number one way we don't affect change, not to belabor the point, is we have a two-party system. <laughs> ah, well done. It is the two-party system. And, mm. and you really nailed it. The, the issue with the two-party system is we have us versus them. Mm -hmm. It's divisive. It's polarizing. What they've done is we're either forced to believe... That we and 140 million other people have the same ideologies <laughs> in, in, with regards to politics, or we're forced to accept it. Yeah, and it's a patently ludicrous idea. Right. We, we can't even agree in America today that both pizza and macaroni and cheese are delicious. <laughs> there are people who don't believe that. Well, would you really call them people? No, they're monsters. <laughs> uh, but there are people who don't believe that. 
but yet somehow our political ideologies align perfectly. Right. Right. So, no, we have us versus them. And, and that is kind of what you point out. The insidious lie here is we're too busy trying to keep out the opposition mm -hmm. instead of trying to find innovative, motivated people that actually will make America great. Thoughtful. Yeah. Thoughtful people. No, it's we're focused on them, less focused on us. And as you said, it only helps the people that are already there. Mm -hmm. The two-party system is awful. It is, uh, we have a bunch of know-nothing, do-nothing people who come from a nepotistic, inbred pool of candidates that we just continually vote on. And our only goal is to keep the other people out of office. It is not to affect change. In America today, we don't actually seem to care to want to affect change. All right, that's number one. Number two, we, we really don't want to affect change. That's actually not something we care about at all. So we, not only do we not do it, we don't really want to do it. At least the ruling class. Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to say even, I, I don't think anybody does. Okay. We talk about it, but I don't think we actually want to do it. So if you look at politics today, um, it's important to be a celebrity in politics. Mm. Uh, you ask a child. It used to be you could ask a child, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they would say, I'd like to be an astronaut or a doctor or a teacher or a nurse or a firefighter. And today, a lot of them will say, I want to be famous. Mm -hmm. And that is no different for adults today. I mean, some adults just go to YouTube for shameless celebrityism and uh, famousness, yeah, make up words, things like that. So, and what we see is in social media, we see people, I mean, social media has ruined this idea that we have elder sage people offering us advice. And respect your elders. Uh, respect your elders. And we will see them say the most repugnant things because they want to be famous. See, because in today today's society, it's more important in politics to be clever mm. than it is to be kind. It's more important to be clever than it is to be thoughtful. It's more important to be clever than it is to be wise. And it's more important to be clever than it is to actually be correct. Those things don't matter in politics today. There is a premium on cleverness. This is where we see the rise of Ben Shapiro. He's super clever. He throws in statistics, and that is enough for everyone who loves Ben Shapiro. They don't question anything beyond that cleverness and those statistics. They don't question whether or not his results um, are, are, are well-founded in anything. Mm -hmm. You know, his conclusions, whether or not they make sense. Cleverness is all that matters. And the problem with this cleverness is we, we look at things as a debate. I can't tell you how many people on social media says, I'm tired of the debate. Of course you are. Because it's a debate. The thing about a debate is there's winners and losers. Uh -huh. That is the only purpose for a debate. Yeah. And it's largely for the people watching or listening to the debate, not the people participating. The goal of the debate is not for you to persuade me that you're correct. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever happened. That has never happened. <laughs> it's for the audience to say, well, that, that person sounds more believable, I guess. Mm -hmm. But nobody's going to really go and fact check it, make sure that that even matters to them, it's to establish winners and losers, much again like our two-party system. Where you have the opposition and you have the winner. That is it. And as long as we're doing that, that means we're not resolving, that means we're not building, that means we're not solving, that means we're not unifying. What we don't need is a debate. What we need is a discussion mm. with the goal of doing all those things I just said. So that's number one, we don't affect change. Number two, we really don't want to. It's not important to us really. Number three, even when we do want to, we're really not good at it. We have no idea what to do to affect change. We see this with ever, every polarizing policy uh, or discussion we have. We see this with women's rights and, um, and abortion. We see this with gun control. We see this with health care. And we see this with things like Black Lives Matter. And today, to my detriment, we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter and how <laughs> ineffective it seems to be. Okay, so off we go. So the issue with Black Lives Matter is that if you have something like that, what you have to recognize is you need a partner, right? If you're the majority in this world, you do not need a partner. You can just make the rules. You just do what you want. Say white guys don't need anyone backing us up. That's true, right? So you need a partner. Uh, you, need, you need someone to 
back you in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So the thing with Black Lives Matter, so the cornerstone of Black Lives Matter is that black people are being killed by cops. There's other stuff, certainly, it's grown, but the cornerstone, look at Colin Kaepernick, is black people being killed by cops. And the issue that they're running into is that there's plenty of people who don't see that as a problem. They don't think there's a problem. So if you want people to support you, you have to convince people there's a problem. Right. Okay. So you need to look at how do you do that? All right. So to convince somebody you have a problem, just think about your job if you had to affect change at your job. What do you have to do? You have to tell them what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Probably have to quantify or qualify what that problem is. Maybe both. Maybe both. You have to uh, show them the impact. So that's what that is, right? You have to show them the impact of the problem. It's not that it just exists, but that's impactful. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to bring some sort of strategy for how you're going to resolve the problem. And you're going to have to talk about cost. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to talk about the cost to do that. Now, here's the thing. It gets really precarious when we talk about the cost of lives. Yes. We don't want to do that. Um, but this is still a necessary thing that has to happen. So I'm going to show you, and I hope Madam Brewmaster is ready for this, I'm going to show you what I mean about the cost of lives. Ryan, I want you to think about cancer. Okay. Okay. I want you to name two types of cancer. Let's start with breast cancer. Okay. And we'll move then to colon cancer. Colon cancer. Madam Brewmaster, I wrote three cancers, three types of cancer, on a piece of paper. And I ranked them in the order that I believe you would say them. Nice. And I was hoping he'd say at least two out of those three. Okay. Madam Brewmaster, what's my number one cancer that I listed? Number one, you wrote down breast. Oh. What's my number two? Prostate. What's my number oh. three? Colon. Colon. Sup, bro? So you said two out of three mm -hmm. of those cancers. Why do you think you picked those two? Probably because they're the ones I've heard the most about. Exactly. Now, all cancers are important. Lots of people die from cancer. Lots of people fund cancer research. Mm -hmm. The reason you've heard about them is because of the impacts of those cancers. That's the thing. So when we talk about our money and how we apply it, mm -hmm. we have, we do rank people's lives. We rank them based on the impact. Mm -hmm. That's why you have heard about them. So even when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we have to put a cost on those lives because we're asking the government to get involved, which is what we're doing here. There's going to be a cost associated with it. That means they're going to take money from something else, mm -hmm. which, by the way, when the government's largely involved, it's because of people and helping people and keeping them alive and giving them resources and things like that, Right. So I want to establish that first. So now let's talk about what the cornerstone of Black Lives Matter is, which is black people being killed by cops. So first, first off, is it people being killed by cops? No. All right. Is it the number of black people being killed by cops? No, okay. it's not. It is the number of black people being killed by cops as it relates to their percentage and representation in society today mm -hmm. in our it's, population it's, yes population yep right and we know this we know that is specifically the case because if it were just the number of people being killed we'd have white lives matter because white people are killed uh more often than black people so let me give you the numbers yep there are a thousand people killed by cops every year of which 500 are white people of which 250 are black people so if we're just strictly account we would have white lives matter. <clears throat> right. But we know, yeah, we know that's not the thing. Right. right. So, okay, so it's 250 black people. The issue here is that black people represent about 13% of the population. Right. And they represent 25% of those being killed by cops. Mm -hmm. All right, so remember, that's, the first step, mm -hmm. first thing we have to do is identify what the problem is and quantify and qualify it if we can. And thankfully, we can. Mm -hmm. So in order for black lives matter to not be a thing anymore, we need to get the number of people that are being killed by cops, black people being killed by cops, down to their at least their uh, representation in our population. Right. So if they're 13% and it's about 1,000 people killed every year, we're looking at about 130 people. Mm -hmm. If it was 130 people, there'd be no discussion. Instead, it's about 250. So we have to explain mm -hmm. 120 people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. That is what we're talking about. Okay. So we've identified the problem. 120 black people being killed by cops. Or we have to prosecute however many cops equals that 120 people. Sure. That's the other thing, because we're talking about justice here. Right. So 120 people being killed by cops. What's your solution? I don't know. Uh, we've heard about maybe training for cops. Okay. How much does that cost? Because we seem to be talking about institutionalized racism, probably a lot. So now we're talking about how a lot of money for 120 lives. 
Okay, so can you tell me the cancer that you donate to that saves 120 people? No. Right. Because you've prioritized your money and you're giving it to breast or colon or prostate or skin cancer is actually number one, believe it or not. That was, uh, that was close on my list. I almost went with skin over colon. Yep. So, so we need to donate some amount of money to 120 lives. Remember, your goal here is to persuade people that think there isn't a problem, that there is in fact a problem. And you're using 120 lives to do that out of 325 million people. If you're paying attention, that percentage is 0.000037%. I would consider that to be statistically insignificant. You would, but that would make you a racist. <laughs> but most people would think anything that is 0.000037% is statistically insignificant. Now, that's kind of your goal as Black Lives Matter. What is significant to you? You have to figure this out because you need to persuade people that's significant. So let's pretend this was Canada. Okay. All proportions are the same. All ratios are, per se are, are the same. Okay. The only thing that's different is the population size. Okay. So if this were Canada, it would be 25 black people are dead and 50 white people. Okay. Is that negligible? Is that statistically insignificant? Or should Canada pass a policy to address 25 black people versus 50 white people? I would say it's still insignificant. Okay. Let's go to Ireland. Okay. All right. Now we're talking four black people, okay. eight white people in the entire country of Ireland. Okay. Should they be passing policy? to save four black people versus eight white people. Still seems insignificant. Okay, let's go right down to the bare minimum here because remember, it's the representation in our population. So at the bare minimum, it's one black person and two white people. Sure. Should we pass policy to uh, regarding it? Seems entirely insignificant. It does. So, so if you're following with me, start with one to two mm -hmm. and then go, if you want four to eight, then go 25 to 50, go 250 to 500 out of 325 million people and tell me where the significance starts, where we're supposed to believe it starts. Because i got to believe that somewhere below 250 and 500, you would say, maybe there's not a problem, mm -hmm. despite the representation in the population. Sure. It's not, at some point, a statistical anomaly can exist. Right, exactly. So that's, that's your trouble here, is that you're using 120 people <laughs> to make your point to people who don't think there's a problem. Largely, they go, 120 out of 325 million? That's nothing. I think you've proven my point. Right, right. I think that's what you're doing here. And I'm not to, and I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. I'm saying that your argument isn't persuasive when you use it that way. Right? So how can you be better at this? Because I'm going to jump in real quick. Okay. I think, I think that if you watch the show, we've made it clear that we think there is some kind of a problem somewhere. Yes. Yep. There is something going on and it's not all bunnies and roses. Yep. But, Definitely not bunnies or roses. <laughs> nope. But seriously, it's, it's not very persuasive. Right. Remember, you're trying to affect change. We're not talking about whether or not you have a legitimate argument. We're talking about whether or not your argument will bring the support you need. Right? You so have to tailor the message to the audience. You do, if you want to affect change. If you don't want to affect change, you can just keep telling us people are dying. Yes. Okay, so how can you affect change? So one of the things that we're stuck on for whatever reason is this idea that we can only affect change by, <laughs> by calling our representatives and protesting. That's all we do. That's all we know how to do. And vote every four to eight years. And vote every four to eight years. And only for the president if we can help it. <laughs> right? We don't even care about senators and stuff. So uh, we, we do our research on the president. So here's the thing. If you want to affect change, I would say that there's lots of other statistics that are really important that are or more demonstrative of your problem. All right. So we could talk about incarceration rates for minorities and black people. It's huge. We're talking millions of people here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're not talking about 120, all right? We're actually talking about, by the way, we haven't talked about this, but not the incarceration rate uh, of black people in the United States, there are more black men in prison than there were slaves. That's crazy. FYI. FYI. Uh, we could talk... Which actually is something that BLM talks about. Ah, uh, well, this right, point. right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's bigger than this, but this is the cornerstone. This is what we right. really talk about. I mean, we talk about police brutality, but give me the statistics on police brutality. And the only statistics we really get thrown in our face is people dying. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're talking about uh, incarceration rates. We talk about poverty. We did this in one of our other videos. If you're born black, you're born into a household, generally speaking, making about 70% less than a white household. Yeah, that's by design by white people, right? Remember, you had black people spent 14 generations in slavery or in Jim Crow era and have only been out of that for three generations. That's important to note. Mm -hmm. It's persuasive 
to reasonable people. All right, 120 people out of 325 just isn't persuasive to even reasonable people as a number. All right, it tugs at the emotional heartstrings, yep. but that's but as a number mm. on its own, it's not. But millions of people in poverty, millions of people being incarcerated, millions of people uh, who have lower paying jobs, millions of people who have less wealth, will, millions of people who are in substandard housing, comparatively speaking, is persuasive. And this really is a poverty issue, in my opinion. Poverty affects disproportionately minorities and black people. And it's by design. And we can talk about it. how can we fix that problem? Because here's the deal. You fix that problem. If you pick, fix poverty, you're going to fix income, which will fix wealth, which will purchase you a house. And having a better house means you're in a better neighborhood with better education, which means we're changing the scenarios in which you're interacting with police officers. Yeah. So if you don't want yes. to be killed by police officers, we really need to talk about the scenarios in which you're interacting with them. All right. So take a look at this. Man killed in New York. Okay. Choked to death by a cop. What was he doing before he was choked to death? He was uh, selling cigarettes. He was selling illegal cigarettes. Because uh, he's not a vendor. Correct. Yeah. Illegal cigarettes. By the way, he could sell a gun. <laughs> There you go. Second Amendment. Did he have wealth and education? Probably not. Okay. Man down in Louisiana, shot by cops. What was he doing? He was selling CDs uh, at yeah. a convenience store, uh, and he had the cops call him with uh, suspect of having a gun. Did he have wealth and education? Probably not. Probably not. Again, this is not victim shaming. What I'm talking about is interactions with cops, right? If you have wealth and you live in a nice neighborhood... And you're not doing any illegal things, the odds of you interacting with cops are diminished. If cops expect you to be in that neighborhood, the odds of you interacting with them is diminished. And I'm not talking about racism here. Like, so there's a guy I know, it was a white dude. He was in Inglewood, California at 11:30 at night. An Uber picked him up and said, I would not have been walking in this part of Inglewood if I were you at 11:30 at night. He's not being racist. He's talking about situational awareness. Right. Right? You stick out in this scenario. So if you're in a scenario where you don't stick out, and again, by design, by design, <laughs> right? If you if you don't stick out, you're going to less likely be bothered by cops. They expect you to be there. Situational awareness tells us this is normal. They're looking for abnormalities when they are approaching people or they're they're approaching people based on expectation that a crime really is possibly being committed because it's a violent neighborhood it's a bad neighborhood so we need to change the perspective of cops by changing the scenarios by changing your circumstances we can do that with more compelling statistics and finally we talked about calling your rep we talked about protesting ben shapiro and people like him will say nobody cares about you <laughs> you know what absolutely cares about you your rep your neighbors. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's true. Your local government cares about uh -huh. you. Why? Because you affect them. Not because they love you. Because you affect them. Let's think about this. We have HOAs because we know my neighbor next door affects my value. We spent 14 generations devaluing black people. Now we need to talk about how to give them value so, so that everyone looks the same. And we have now mitigated those differences and that perspective. But they care about you. Maybe talking to your local government about how you can affect change in your neighborhood. Listen, I live in a nice neighborhood. Uh, even if there was a gang neighborhood next door, I wouldn't like that. I don't want them anywhere near me. No. I'd like my neighborhoods in general around me to be better. I want my educational system to be better because that increases my value. I want the cost of housing to rise all around me because that, uh, was it rising tides? Raise, raise all, all ships. ships. That's what we want. Your neighbors care about you. They don't want to be near violent, homeless people. No, they want to be in nice neighborhoods, surrounded by nice neighborhoods, surrounded by nice neighborhoods. We do not know how to affect change even when we want to. We don't affect change. We don't usually don't care to. And we don't know how to even when we do. And that is what America is doing wrong. Last call. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Till next time, thank you for joining us. And remember, just beer and politics. Thanks so much for watching. 
Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and check us out on social media. Links can be found below. You can get all our episodes as a podcast on your favorite platform. Here are a couple videos we think you might enjoy. Until next time, remember, it's just beer and politics.